Okay, so lovely to see everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're very lucky today. We have Simon Whitney, um, who is um, um, a visiting professor at the LSE and is a practicing lawyer, practices for many years at uh, Travis Smith, which I'm sure many of you will know, the London-based firm. He's done a lot of work in um, private equity, corporate governance, company law, that sort of area. Um, he's going to talk to us today about sustainable finance regulation and private markets. Um, and uh, I should just hand over to him, really, so he has plenty of time to talk. And there'll be Q&A afterwards. The Q&A will not be recorded, so you can ask whatever you like. Um, and um, we will have to finish by about five to one. Uh, five to two, rather, so manage expectations. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, appreciate it. Um, yes, I'm going to talk, um, and I'll have to try and make sure I finish in time to leave uh, some time for your questions. But I, I actually don't mind if you want to raise questions as we go along. Uh, if, if, if Certainly, if there's anything that you want to pick up on as I'm speaking, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, sustainable finance. I'm a private markets lawyer, and most of the work I do in practice is helping private markets firms to understand how sustainable finance affects their business um, and how the, the, the rules, particularly the financial services regulation around sustainable finance affects how they should be um, conducting their business and how they should be approaching ESG and sustainability in the way they raise their funds and in the way they make their investments. So that's the angle um, that I'm coming at this from. Um, the sustainable finance regulation that I'm speaking about is not, is not specific to private markets at all. The sustainable finance regulation that I'm going to be speaking about, that, that, that's predominantly the EU's uh, regulation, but I'll also, if there's time, mention a little bit about the UK's approach. Uh, the, these regulatory interventions are very broad, and they cover all, the whole range of financial markets participants. Um, uh, they, they certainly cover all asset managers, not just alternative asset managers or or private markets uh, managers. Um, but I will try and give you a little bit of an insight into how uh, the private markets are coping with uh, absorbing these uh, new and complicated, very important uh, regulatory interventions, predominantly at the moment from the, uh, fr from the EU. So first of all, I'll ask uh, the question, what is sustainable finance? I won't dwell on that for very long. And also, won't dwell on the drivers for sustainable finance in the private markets uh, for very long, but there's a little bit of data that I wanted to share with you on that, just so that you understand uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, and then I was going to talk uh, mostly about the EU's current answer to uh, what, it, what it sees as the policy problems uh, associated with, um, with, with, sustainable fi with finance and with the lack of uh, sustainability in the financial markets as they see it with the short-termism and the lack of focus on long-term drivers as, as the regulators have seen it. I'll talk mostly about the EU's answer to that. There isn't really much to say about the US's answer yet. That is developing, though, and there will be a lot more to say about that in the years to come. Um, and the UK is, 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 is also working hard on some important sustainable finance regulation, which, as I say, I'll try to mention. So what do we mean by sustainable finance. Well, I just took the European Commission's definition because since we're mostly talking about EU regulation, it seemed to me that, that was a, a good place to start. A actually, there is no really um, single uh, agreed upon definition of what we mean by the term sustainable finance. But certainly this is what the European Commission says it means. It's the process of taking environmental, social and governance considerations into account when making investment decisions in the financial sector, uh, leading to more long-term investments in sustainable economic activities and projects. So not a surprising definition. Essentially, what they're saying is, is that when people in the financial sector are making investment decisions, and when they say investment decisions, they don't just mean decisions whether to invest or divest into a particular company or, or other asset, other, uh, other, other security. What they mean is uh, as well as that, um, how you steward your approach to ownership, your stewardship approach whilst you own an asset, how you engage uh, with, in, many, in, in most cases, ultimate corporate entities um, to, to, um, uh, to encourage them to behave in, in certain ways. So uh, how do you, in the process of buying and selling assets and engaging uh, with underlying uh, 
uh, investments, you know, how do you, if at all, take into account environmental, which is obviously climate change related issues, but is far from only climate change related issues, includes issues like biodiversity loss and circular economy and water conservation and so on. How do you take environmental issues? How do you take social issues into account, meaning you know, how, how the human rights of the stakeholders of these businesses affected by your activities, for example, um, and governance considerations. So things often put into that category, although I would actually argue these are more social, but things like bribery and corruption, uh, sanctions rules, um, th th those kinds of things that, uh, that boards of directors ought to be paying attention to uh, when they're making decisions. So how are those things taken into account when you're making the decisions you make? And the expectation, uh, clear from this definition, although not clearly supported by a huge amount of evidence that I've come across, the assumption is that if people take these things into account when they're making investment decisions, it will lead to longer term investments in sustainable economic activities and projects. So that's certainly the belief um, that the European Commission has. So, um, so, so I suppose the, the, the question is, to what extent can we expect people making investment decisions in the financial sector to just do this, to encourage companies to make uh, more uh, sustainable decisions? And uh, for that, um, there are a number of, uh, of different um, questions that we need to address. And I'm not going to uh, really spend any time on that now because we don't have time. But it, it's, it's, to my mind, most important to try to understand what the incentives are of the various decision makers in the, in the investment process. So, so what are the incentives of the underlying directors of corporates, which are you know, usually the, 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 the most important target of these um, of, 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 the, uh, of the question of sustainable finance activity. What, what are the underlying incentives of those corporate directors? What are the incentives of the, uh, of the shareholders um, who have some power over um, those directors? What are the incentives of the asset managers um, and the other intermediaries who, uh, who really control the decision-making of, uh, of, 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 of the financial resources that... Um, that, 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 that go, to, uh, go into, this, um, into this investment chain? Uh, and what are the incentives of the underlying investors, you know, the, the, the people in, who ultimately benefit or don't benefit from the financial and non-financial outcomes associated with these, uh, with these investments? And it's, it's, it's really important to understand that, but it's also important to understand how this question of fiduciary duty plays into it. So many of those people that I mentioned, the directors of the companies, the asset managers themselves, regard themselves as being bound by, and, and indeed in many cases are bound by, fiduciary duties, duties to act in the best interests uh, of a particular group of people, usually the kind of ultimate beneficiaries. And so how that plays into the way that they think about their responsibility and the extent to which they think of themselves as being able to think about uh, outcomes that are not financial uh, necessarily directly financial is also a very important um, and, and, and currently very topical question. So, so do, do, do we expect fiduciary duty to, to help or hinder um, those decision makers in coming to conclusions which allow them to focus on long-term sustainable uh, economic activities and projects? Um, we need to think about um, the fact that there is imperfect information, so people have incentives perhaps to declare um, that they've got a climate transition plan or that they really focus on human rights, but, you know, do we really rely on those commitments? How much, can, how much store can we set by public announcements or even regulatory disclosures that are made by these people? Uh, and a very important question is, actually, if you are a steward, if you are an asset manager, let's say, um, you know, how much impact does it have if you just make investment decisions based on Sustainability. So let's say you just say, well, we're no longer going to invest in coal. We're no longer going to invest in activities where, um, you know, where, which rely heavily on, 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 on intensive carbon emissions, on, on fossil fuels and so on. Does that, does that uh, divestment, does that refusal to invest actually affect real world outcomes? Or does that just mean that those assets are held by perhaps even less responsible Owners and so the the, 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 the the harm is still done, but it's just not done um, by 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 somebody that you're financing. What's the impact of 
of, of engagement. So can we actually say, well, we will hold these assets, but we'll engage uh, with, with, with the, uh, the directors, with the business, and we'll try to, to act as responsible stewards and steer them in a particular direction. How effective is that, and how does that compare to uh, divesting? And so these are really, really important questions. In the end, my, my view is that none of this sustainable finance, although important, is uh, no substitute for government action. So what's really going to drive the incentives of the decision makers is, 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 is government action, whether that be through taxation, a carbon tax, for example, or, or regulation and better enforcement of regulation. Um, so a requirement that every business has a credible transition plan to net zero by 2050 and proper enforcement to make sure that that is then not just being delivered uh, on an ongoing basis, but also kind of followed through um, uh, it, 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 across the whole of the, uh, the financial, across the whole of the corporate sector. So, so these are, you know, finance, sustainable finance is important, but to my mind, it's not necessarily even the most important uh, uh, question to drive people in the right direction. But nevertheless, um, the European Commission ha has um, decided, uh, and uh, many uh, regulators have decided that finance has a huge role to play, and that they can steer, um, they can steer the financial community into into helping here. Do private equity firms take ESG considerations into account? Well, this is actually the data I wanted to share with you. I, I, I could talk for a long time about why I believe that private equity firms do have incentives to take um, uh, environmental, social, and governance issues into account. Um, but I, I just thought I'd share this survey, which was published uh, recently. It's, a, it's currently a working paper. Um, but it's based on a, uh, on a survey of a fairly significant number of, um, uh, of, of, of private equity firms and their investors. And I've highlighted in green uh, the top uh, reason why um, these asset managers do say that they take ESG considerations into account. Um, and it's, you know, it's because they believe that ESG relates to investment risk. So the idea is that, that, that the incentive to take account of environmental, social, and governance issues comes from the fact that investments will be less risky and therefore the risk-adjusted returns on those investments will be better uh, if uh, those uh, factors are taken into account. Uh, and, and that does, that, when you drill down, what you find is what they mean is not all ESG issues all of the time, but material ESG issues that are particularly important for that particular business. So if you're investing in a company that's... Uh, uh, that's got a long supply chain and there's, um, uh, there's a risk of human rights abuse in that supply chain, then taking care of that issue and making sure that it uh, is put right is really important because ultimately um, if, 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 that issue, if that risk comes to bear, if it comes to pass, and, and it's quite clear that there are human rights abuses, then that will have a big impact on the, on the financial success of the business, either because customers stop buying the, the stuff or because regulators... Um, uh, you know, shut down the supply chain and, and issue fines or take other regulatory actions. So investment risk is, is by far and away the dominant uh, reason. And, and what that means is that we can expect perhaps private markets firms and other, uh, and, and other similar actors to take account of ESG where it has a financially material impact on the investment, but perhaps not so much uh, where it doesn't. So you, you, you look at an investment and you think, actually, there are some things wrong with this investment from a, an environmental or, or a social point of view, but they're not actually going to affect um, the value of that investment. They're not actually going to affect uh, how, it, how, it, how it delivers returns to my ultimate beneficiaries. So my fiduciary duty perhaps uh, requires that I don't take account of those things because spending money on trying to address problems that aren't problems uh, for my ultimate beneficiaries is, is perhaps even a breach of my fiduciary duty, whereas if it's something that does have a material impact, then not only is it part of my fiduciary duty to address it, um, but it's going to deliver better risk-adjusted returns to my ultimate beneficiaries. So the, the idea here is that the incentive uh, to focus on ESG is strongest um, and, and, and perhaps only really exists for certain types of asset manager where there's a perception that a particular ESG issue has a direct impact or could have a direct impact on risk and return. Uh, in the underlying company. And private equity firms are very, very focused on that, and they do understand that lots of ESG issues do have a direct, direct impact on their ultimate returns, and that's why, in many cases, they are heavily uh, focused on, on this. The, the other driver, of course, uh, 
is that your, your, your investors might just require it. So they might say, well, actually, you know, we've, we're giving you an explicit investment mandate which says you have to achieve this. And that's exactly, for example, what an impact fund is. It's a fund where the investors say we're investing in you because we think you will deliver financial performance for us, but also you will achieve um, some, some uh, outcomes which we regard as um, important. And, and so you have an explicit investment mandate, which means you have to, as part of your fiduciary duty to focus on these things because you've uh, undertaken to your investors uh, that, that, that you will do. So these are the reasons why I think um, you do see ESG increasingly being taken into account. But, but the policymakers, notwithstanding that kind of market response, if you like, to ESG, um, have, have nevertheless been concerned. And in, in the EU, there was certainly a perceived failure of asset managers to consider ESG issues in their portfolios, e even those that did affect risk and return. So a kind of blindness, apparently, uh, from certain uh, financial markets participants uh, as to how these ESG risks and opportunities did affect financial return. And that, that, that they thought that policymakers clearly thought that there was a market failure here, that, um, uh, that, that even people who were properly incentivized to take account of these issues weren't taking account of them. Um, so the response to that was, the policy response to that was, well, let's make sure that asset managers have a regulatory duty to consider ESG risks in their portfolio. In other words, to confirm that this is part of their fiduciary duty. It's not, um, it's not something separate. And, and, and therefore make them disclose their approach to ESG risks uh, as part of their, of their investment reporting obligation. So, so that was a first and, and very important policy objective the European Commission had, which was relatively modest, of course. It's just saying take account of financially material ESG risks as part of your fiduciary duty. Second was a, a, a concern about greenwashing. You'll all know the term greenwashing. I'm sure it refers to overstating your uh, environmental or social uh, or governance credentials, to o overstating the extent to which you care about these things uh, and then not following through on that in practice. The idea being that investors are induced to invest in your financial product because they believe that you're doing some good in the world or at least that you're mitigating some harms in the world, even if you're not actively doing good, but then you just don't do that. You don't deliver on that promise, and so you're uh, you're induced. You're, you're effectively um, uh, pulling the wool over the the investor's eyes, greenwashing. Um, and so here, the policy response was: Well, let's make transparent uh, through initial and ongoing disclosure uh, what it is that actually is happening. So you've got to declare at the beginning precisely what your uh, sustainability objectives are, if you have any. Do you have any yes or no? If so, exactly what are they? And then every year, we want you to report against that sustainability uh, objective. So how so investors can see, are you actually achieving what you said you would uh, seek to achieve? Are you even seeking to achieve what you said you'd seek to achieve, let alone uh, are you actually delivering uh, positive outcomes? So secondly, they thought, well, we could also label some products, right? So we could actually say, uh, this is a product which will deliver certain sustainability outcomes. It's labelled so that everybody knows that that's part of what the product does, uh, and then there'll be some ongoing obligations um, to deliver against those goals if you're a, a labelled product. And then finally, and really importantly, the EU's developed a taxonomy. It's, the EU's not the only taxonomy. There are, there, there are many taxonomies around the world, but the EU's is the most ambitious to date, and a taxonomy or classification system is really a way for economic activities to be classified according to whether they are sustainable or whether they are not sustainable. Not sustainable doesn't mean unsustainable, it just means they're not um, qualifying for the sustainable um, uh, classification. And so the EU has spent a lot of time and a lot of political capital, uh, I have to say, uh, developing this, uh, this classification system which allows any, any economic activity to be classified according to whether it fits into their criteria for sustainable or, or whether it doesn't. And that's a big, ambitious project, and it's something that's in, intended to help ultimate investors understand whether or not they're financing something which is sustainable or, 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 whether, it, or, whether, it's, or whether it's not. And the third objective that they had, um, the European Commission expressed, at the beginning of this process of regulation was that they wanted to mobilize capital 
to more socially sustainable objectives. So here, a much more of a kind of an ambitious policy objective, which is to say, not only do we want to protect investors, not only do we want to make sure asset managers understand their fiduciary duties, but we also uh, want to actually encourage um, you know, more investment in so socially sustainable products, uh, uh, environmentally or socially sustainable projects so that we can deliver on the EU's goals for, for example, carbon neutrality and, 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 and so on. So, um, so again, this is a specific sort of desire to move capital. There's an assumption made, though, that if they do uh, stamp out greenwashing, if they do focus on fiduciary duties, that actually um, investors um, will, uh, will want to seek out those, um, those more sustainable asset managers. So there's an assumption that if you tell investors um, you can trust this label, you can trust this asset manager to deliver on what they're saying, then uh, the, the, the kind of ultimate investors will uh, move their money in a way that, that gives more funding for those projects. So that was an act of faith in, in some, some respects on the part of the regulators. So the idea that they'll, they'll encourage more capital to socially and, and, and environmentally sustainable projects, mostly uh, by, um, by making sure that investors had confidence that... Uh, they would actually get what they were being promised. So those were the policy objectives and the suggested solutions, a combination of disclosure and clarification of fiduciary duty uh, and, and the taxonomy. And so what did, the, um, what did the EU do? Well, it brought forward something called the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Now, this is a parallel piece of regulation to the taxonomy that I just mentioned. But the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation is a, is a, is a relatively short uh, piece of uh, legislation, but supported by some detailed and lengthy implementing uh, regulations, some, some regulatory technical standards um, that were drafted by the, um, by, 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 by the regulators, the, super, the European supervisory authorities and, and the European Commission, uh, and, um, and really supplement the, the relatively high level, uh, level one text. And what the um, SFDR does is it creates separate classifications for different types of financial product. And what's at the heart of the SFDR is categorizing financial products according to uh, whether they fit within you know, one or other of these designations. Now, these, these are, although I mentioned that labeling was one of the ideas that the Commission had, the, the, the SFDR, despite what many people in the market believe, is not a labeling regime. So these are categories, but they're not labels. What I mean by that is that they don't guarantee particular minimum standards, many objectively determinable minimum standards. They are, they are actually disclosure obligations rather than uh, labels. Uh, and and, and the, the type of category, category you fall into determines your disclosure, your ongoing disclosure obligations. So the EU has created these uh, really four different uh, categories of financial products. Um, and these are now in the market, generally speaking, known by the article number in the SFDR that they relate to. So you've got um, essentially three different shades of green. Uh, you've got a light green Article 8 product, which is one that supposedly promotes environmental and social uh, and or social characteristics. So it's a, you go out to investors and you actively talk about environmental or social outcomes when you try to sell them your financial product. You promote characteristics of, about this project, uh, this product, which uh, relate to its environmental or social outcomes. Uh, and if you do that, then you are an Article 8 product. You don't have a choice about that. You can't say, well, I'm going to talk about ESG, but I'm not going to be Article 8. I'm going to be Article 6. The, the category, you don't choose your categorization. It chooses you based on how you promote your your project. So you choose it only to the extent that you decide what you say about your project. But once you've said our product is going to focus on ESG outcomes, then you are automatically categorized as, as Article 8, uh, light green. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, there's Article 9. Article 9 products apparently are those that only invest in sustainable investments. So every underlying investment in the portfolio has to qualify as a sustainable investment. And then there's this middle category where you're halfway between the two. So you say at least some percentage of our investments will be sustainable investments, not all of them, but in relation to all of them, we have some environmental or social objectives in our investment decision-making process. Now, all, all of these products, basically every financial product, has this obligation to disclose its approach to sustainability risk. And I'll, I'll come back to that 
in a moment. But essentially what we're talking about with sustainability risk is how you approach financially material issues. So this comes back to the idea of clarification of fiduciary duty that I mentioned, the first of the regulatory objectives. So the European Commission says um, that the part of your fiduciary duty is to take account of financially material ESG issues. So you've got to tell investors how you're doing that. You've just got to disclose to them how you're doing that. And that's everyone, because this is not just for green products. This is for any product. This is part of the fiduciary duty of any investment manager. There is an option to explain that you, why you don't take account of ESG issues, but there would be a very, very narrow subset of financial products where that was relevant. Let's say you were just co-investing and it was just a complete blind co-investment, in which case you might say, well, we can't take account of ESG issues because we don't have any visibility of them. But in most cases, um, the expectation is that you do take account of ESG issues in your decision making to the extent that they are financially material. And, and, and then secondly, uh, all products also have to declare whether they think about negative externalities in their investment decision making. So, so not just do you take account of financially material issues, but do you also take account of what are called principal adverse impacts in the regulation? So do you also take account of the things that don't affect the financial risk and return related to your product, but do you nevertheless think about those uh, external impacts just because you believe that they are important? And so all products have to declare whether or not they do that uh, from, from, from March last year onwards. If, if you're one of these uh, Article 8 or 9 products, though, uh, you have uh, additional disclosure obligations. So really this is the prevention of greenwashing objective, how can investors assess whether or not you've actually delivered on your promises? Uh, the, the promotion of the characteristics, if you're an Article 8 Light Fund, or the investment in sustainable investments, if you're an Article 9 Fund. How can we tell whether you've done that? Well, the answer is there's very detailed, ongoing disclosure obligations that, that, that arise. So you can see that to some extent all of the, well, certainly the fiduciary duty objective uh, and the um, anti-greenwashing objective are... Uh, encapsulated in this piece of legislation, as I say, with an assumption that that will also help to mobilise capital in the right direction. But the problem is, and I'm going to spend the next five or ten minutes uh, just talking about some of the problems, because the problem for the uh, uh, EU regulatory regime is that it's been uh, very, very, very difficult, enormously difficult, immensely costly for firms to implement, because it's really very, very difficult to understand and interpret. Whilst one can understand at a high level what the objectives are, as I've just described, when one actually looks at the text, not just the level one text, but the regulatory technical standards that uh, are really important, uh, secondary legislation, uh, one, one, one finds that it's really difficult to understand uh, what, what's going on. So, for example, um, the term sustainable investment is fundamental. If you looked at my previous slide, you'll have seen that an Article 8 plus product has to invest at least some portion in sustainable investments. An Article 9 product can only invest in sustainable investments. Unfortunately, nobody knows what that term means, and it's not, uh, properly, uh, it's not properly defined in the regulation. I've just repeated on this slide uh, what the regulation actually says a sustainable investment is. It's, a, it's an investment in an economic activity that contributes to an environmental objective, and then it gives you some examples, but not a definitive list or an investment in an activity that contributes to a social objective, again, giving you some examples, but not a definitive list, provided that the, that, that investment does not significantly harm any of the objectives, environmental or social objectives, um, with, with, with very, very little uh, clue as to how you measure what constitutes significant harm, and that the investing companies follow good governance practices. Again, no real definition of what constitutes good governance um, but some uh, things called out, and actually they're not necessarily the things that one would ordinarily call out in relation to good governance, sound management structures, yes, but they specifically focus on employee relations, remuneration of staff, and tax compliance. Important issues, of course, but no mention of many of the other uh, important governance characteristics that one would expect to see uh, in, a, in, a, in a well governed uh, company. So, um, for example, you know, although maybe it's implicit in sound management structures, but no, no question, no discussion of management of risk within the company, no, no, dis no discussion of, of bribery and corruption risks and sanctions, compliance and, and other things. So uh, one might think that they're implicit and, and, and these are only meant to be examples, but nevertheless, 
Um, there's not a clear definition of what constitutes good governance and why these things are more important, perhaps, or at least they're singled out uh, in the regulation as opposed to others. So a very, very difficult uh, definition for people to understand, but an absolutely critical definition because unless you understand what sustainable investment is, you don't understand what an Article 9 fund, a dark green fund, can invest in. Um, so as an ultimate investor, you've really got very little idea as to, uh, as to, as to what this Article 9 categorization is, is telling you. The answer the European Commission might give is it doesn't really matter. It's not telling you anything. It's not a label. Uh, it's just, just some, a trigger for a disclosure obligation. Uh, and so as long as they then tell you on an ongoing basis why they think these investments are sustainable and how they've decided this, then that, that's, that's good enough because that's our anti-greenwashing objective is to make sure that uh, investors can, can see what's uh, being invested in on an ongoing basis. The problem, of course, is that the market has interpreted this as a label and people expect their Article 9 product or their, even their Article 8 product to deliver certain outcomes rather than just disclosure and the question is, you know, does anybody really focus on the ongoing disclosure anyway? And is it too late by the time they read their disclosures um, uh, because they've already made their investment decision and they've already been financing these activities uh, for some time? So, um, so, so I would argue it does absolutely matter that we understand um, with some objective certainty what a sustainable investment is. And, of course, the taxonomy was deliberately designed to do exactly that job. So the taxonomy does tell us what, at least in the view of the of the European Commission advised by a group of experts you know what they regard as sustainable economic activities but there's no direct link between the definition of sustainable investment and the taxonomy and that's partly because the SFDR came first and the taxonomy followed a few months later it's partly because the taxonomy only focuses on environmentally sustainable activities so we only have a taxonomy for green I, I environmentally friendly activities at the moment we don't have an equivalent social taxonomy, and although there are plans to develop one, they're a long way off from, from fruition. So at the moment, the taxonomy doesn't really help us uh, to decide whether something's sustainable in the context of uh, the SFDR, and that creates a real gap and it's a real problem for the market. I mean, just to give you a quick uh, sense as to the level of uncertainty, the regulators themselves have written to the European Commission in the last couple of months, and they've said, we don't understand what you mean by, or what the regulation means by, um, uh, makes a, a, a contribution to an environmental objective or a contribution to a social objective. We don't understand what that means. So, for example, does it mean, this is what they've asked, does it mean that the economic activity in and of itself must contribute to an environmental objective? In other words, you know, it's a solar park, it's, it's generating renewable energy, which in and of itself contributes to an environmental objective, uh, you know, to the production of renewable energy. Um, but, or, or is it good enough if a company just says, look, we currently, uh, we currently emit a huge amount of carbon and we've got this fantastic plan to emit a lot less in 10 years' time, so are we then, by financing this activity, contributing to um, an environmental objective? In other words, at the moment we're doing something that's not particularly sustainable, but we've got a plan to do it much more sustainably in a sort of transition plan. Is that enough to contribute? And, and, and we don't know what the answer to that question is because the European Commission hasn't told us what they think the answer is. And of course, what they think the answer is is only their opinion because in the end, this is, this is uh, law. So, um, uh, so, so, so we, still, we still won't know for absolute certain, but everybody will, will basically fall into line with what the European Commission tells them. So there's this huge uncertainty around this key definition, which is a real problem. Uh, for everyone. And, and, and you know, similarly, we don't know what it means to promote an environmental or social characteristic. Um, so, for, for example, if, um, if, if I raise a fund and I say I focus on uh, ESG because I think it's important um, for investors' returns, you know, it's, it's an important risk factor that I need to focus on. And I tell my investors that when I go fundraising, is that promotion of an environmental or social characteristic? I mean, I'm just doing what every asset manager is supposed to do, right, which is to focus on uh, ESG as part of my fiduciary duty. But I'm making a big play of it. So does that then push me into Article 8 as somebody's promoting environment? We, we just don't really know the answer to that. But the problem is that the market is assuming that if you categorise yourself as Article 8 because you do promote some environmental or social characteristic, then you are, um, they, they think that you are guaranteeing them some minimum 
standard in relation to sustainability. And of course you're not. I mean, if, if you take my example, I mean, um, actually a better example, if I'm investing in a way that says I take care of people's human rights in the underlying companies that I invest in. So I really focus on health and safety in my investment mandate because I really care about human rights. And so I will um, promote this characteristic to my investors. I would say if you invest in my product, you know that the employees of the underlying businesses that you're financing, their human rights, their, the health and safety issues relating to those employees will be, I will make sure they're properly taken into account. Um, I could then be investing in coal mines, right? And I could just be a really good um, uh, uh, coal mine operator and say that, uh, you know, there's, there's fantastic training, best in class health and safety standards for the coal mine. But the end investors who are invested in this light green product might be quite surprised that their light green product is actually investing in coal mines. That's an extreme example. I'm not aware of any firm that's actually done that. But the point is um, that this vague definition gives rise to the risk that people are really not understanding uh, what they're investing in. So that's a real problem for the European Commission. The, the level two text, these regulatory technical standards, they're very complex. They, the, the reporting that you have to do on an ongoing basis, if you're an Article 8 or an Article 9 product, is in accordance with set templates. The templates are really uh, very difficult uh, for retail investors to understand because they're not really written in the language that uh, most people would be able to follow and because they use terminology like sustainable investment, which itself not particularly well defined. So these templates are costly to, for, for firms to produce, but arguably don't really deliver a huge amount of benefit. Uh, I've already said that the market per perceives these categories as labels. There is some level of label. That's part of the problem, because um, you can only invest in companies with good governance if you're an Article 8 product doesn't tell you what good governance means, but it does at least impose some minimum standard. You can only invest in sustainable investments if you're an Article 9, but it doesn't tell you what sustainable investments are, but it does at least impose some minimum standard. So there's a kind of an element of, of minimum standards, but they're really not clear and they're really not well defined. And they, were, they didn't start out life as labels, in fact. You know, this wasn't designed as a labeling scheme. It was designed as a disclosure scheme. So that creates a, a problem. And then I mentioned before that you have to say whether you think about negative externalities in your investment decision making, so-called principal adverse impacts. But, um, uh, these are, uh, but what you have to think about is now in a prescribed list. And it's a very long list, includes a number of things uh, that are really hard to measure in, in the real world. Um, and you might not even have the data available to be able to take these things into account. And they're largely backward looking. So they're much more focused on what you did over the course of last year rather than what you're planning to do over the course of the following year. So they're not really uh, fit for purpose as a list of negative externalities. And if you tick yes, we are considering principal adverse impacts, then the obligation, in theory at least, is to consider all of these listed principal adverse impact indicators before you make an investment decision, which is the, you know, for most people, the critical moment. Do we invest in this or not? And okay, well, we've got to consider the negative externalities, so we need all this data before we can make an investment decision. And then you have to publish uh, the results of these indicators publicly on an ongoing basis. So it's quite onerous to consider principal adverse impact. So actually, a lot of people are ticking no. So a lot of people are saying we don't consider principal adverse impacts in our investment decision because we just can't. We don't have the data to do that. Can you just give an example of a principal adverse impact indicators? Like what so for example, one, so there are some obvious ones like scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as an absolute number, but um, also a measure of carbon intensity. So that might be quite interesting and helpful, although, of course, it's very sector dependent. You know, you, you invest in a fund with very low carbon emissions. It's because it might be just investing in technology companies, um, whereas actually you might want to deliver some impact by providing underserved communities in um, sub-Saharan Africa with access to data, with access to digital uh, communication and that might involve some data centers and that might use so you know this it, it's it's not it's not I don't think you could argue that it's enough just to give somebody that raw piece of information but also things like unadjusted gender pay gap um, you have to produce the unadjusted gender pay gap for the for the portfolio businesses for example which again uh, a is not always available uh, to an investor depending on where, where, where they're investing. But B, in and of itself, doesn't really tell you very much because, as we know, different industries have very different uh, gender pay gaps. This is, just a, this is not to do with, you know, necessarily to do with discrimination. It's to do with the balance of 
of, of uh, male and female workers in the workforce, and it varies a lot from industry to industry. So just telling your investors what the unadjusted gender pay gap is, I would argue, is pretty meaningless. There's been, a, there's, there's been a recognition of a lot of these failures by the European Commission, and actually these principal adverse impact indicators, which were called not fit for purpose by the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, a, a well-known NGO. They, they are in the process of trying to, to rewrite them, essentially, but that will take them, that will take them some time. So the problems will get resolved, but um, in the meantime, the, the costs of doing that are, are very high. Um, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just briefly talk a little bit more about, and I'm going to stop to, to see if there are any questions, um, but I'll just talk briefly about the taxonomy, because this is a really interesting, very important, politically contentious project, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, but but the, the EU taxonomy, and by the way, the UK is committed to a UK taxonomy, which will be similar but not quite the same, as the EU taxonomy and work is continuing at the moment on, on defining that. The EU taxonomy is a very, very complicated piece of legislation. It, 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 it's got detailed criteria that allows any economic activity to be assessed according to whether it's environmentally sustainable and therefore aligns with the taxonomy. Taxonomy alignment is the, is, is, is the outcome for an activity that passes the, the detailed tests. Uh, it's only partially in force. The, the two climate related. So it has six objectives, the taxonomy. So in order to be taxonomy aligned, the first thing you have to do is to make a contribution to one of six environmental objectives. Only the first two objectives have been defined so far, and those two objectives relate to climate change. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and, and then if, um, and then, you know, the SFDR says that if you're a financial market participant, you have to disclose the extent to which your portfolio is taxonomy aligned, so you have to give a taxonomy alignment percentage. But of course the problem is that at the moment you don't have the underlying data from the companies that you've invested in. The taxonomy regulation principally and, and, and certainly also requires companies to provide taxonomy alignment data, but it's only EU companies and it's only large, at the moment anyway, it's only large EU companies that meet the definition of large under the non-financial reporting directive. So certain companies in the EU are starting to to provide this data, but it's only a very small subset of the total investable universe by an asset manager, certainly if it's one that invests internationally. So some of the data isn't there um, at the moment, but, but nevertheless, this obligation to report your level of taxonomy alignment exists. Um, the remaining um, taxonomy objectives, the remaining four, are supposed to take effect in 2023, but the detailed criteria haven't yet been finalised, so whether they'll Come, come, whether they'll meet that deadline or not is not yet clear, but in principle, the, the taxonomy will become fully effective from January uh, next year. And I just include this chart, you'll, you'll have the slides, but um, essentially, um, in order to be taxonomy aligned, you first of all must contribute substantially to one of the environmental objectives. As I mentioned, there are six, uh, two related to climate change, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, and then four others that uh, relate to other environmental objectives, biodiversity, circular economy, and so on. And so you've got to su substantially contribute to one of those as, a, as an activity, and, and this is activity by activity, it's not company by company. So a company could have many activities, and each one has to be assessed separately. And, and if that activity makes a substantial contribution, substantial contribution is defined by the, by the, by the detailed rules, so it's not enough just to produce a little bit of renewable energy, you've got to produce a certain amount, you've got to, you've got to actually uh, deliver a substantial contribution to one of these objectives. If you pass those tests, then um, you have to pass a do no significant harm test. So then, a bit like the definition of sustainable investment that I mentioned in SFDR, you also have to run a whole load of tests on every other outcome of the business to make sure that you don't breach other Guidelines. So in other words, if you're making a load of renewable energy, but you're doing so in a, water, in a way that's very water inefficient, or indeed impinges the human rights of the people who work uh, to clean the solar panels, then you're not, um, then, then not going to be taxonomy aligned, notwithstanding the fact that you've passed the first test to make a contribution. You haven't passed the second to do no significant harm test. Yeah. So but then are oil majors and tobacco companies just automatically excluded? Yes. The yes. Okay. So, so, so in, in essence, yes. Tobacco is a bit more difficult because that's, um, you know, that's a so that's a, a, a social issue, not a an environmental issue, and it's not at all clear whether or not 
um, you know, to what extent um, a, a tobacco company would fail to do no significant harm tests at the moment. But, um, but yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're producing oil, then, um, well, A, you're probably not making a contribution to an environmental activity, but you're also not likely to pass the do no significant harm test. I raised it because they've all got these long-term transformation plans. Yes. Clean energy. Yes. All this, but so the taxonomy, so, that's, so one of the criticisms of the taxonomy, and there are many criticisms, one of the criticisms of the taxonomy is that it doesn't fully sort of acknowledge transition. So it, it identifies activities which are already sustainable, not those that are moving in a sustainable, to, on a path to being sustainable. What, what the taxonomy does do, and it's important to, to distinguish uh, what I just said from this, is that it does recognize that there are certain activities that we just have to have, um, and, um, and, and actually um, natural gas and nuclear energy are, are two of those activities that have been decided that we actually have to have them. Cement is another one, actually. We need cement. We can't do without it, and there is no environmentally, environmentally friendly alternative. So there are, there, there's a recognition that those kinds of activities are taxonomy eligible, so you can include them in the taxonomy. But in order to be taxonomy aligned, you have to pass some really stringent criteria uh, in relation to you know, the thresholds that you, that you must meet in order to achieve those, uh, in order to pass the, the do no significant harm test. So you can, for example, be a very, very energy efficient cement manufacturer, even though cement's horrible in terms of its environmental impact. If you're in the kind of top 10% of, of, of cement manufacturers, uh, based on your environmental performance, then you can qualify for taxonomy alignment. The same with natural gas and nuclear. I said that the taxonomy had used a lot of political capital from the Commission, and that's, you know, the inclusion of natural gas and nuclear power is very controversial uh, and, um, and, and, you know, did, did, did create quite a lot of uh, uh, discussion amongst member states, let's say, as to whether or not each, you know, either of those activities should be included. But ultimately, the Commission has included... Uh, the, the taxonomy does include them subject to these stringent kind of rules. So is, is the taxonomy promoting innovative uh, processes in order to become more sustainable? Or on the contrary, is describing how things are now, and therefore in a way it's a kind of static uh, uh, picture no, of yeah. uh, the economy today? Yeah, well that's one of the questions that people are asking. Does the taxonomy just effectively provide finance to organizations that have already transitioned into being sustainable and therefore don't actually need the finance anymore um, and shouldn't we be financing businesses that are that need finance in order to move um, in a sustainable direction I think that there's a that's a good uh, question and it's a it's a justified criticism of the taxonomy uh, one thing I would say is that you can have a use of pro so you could for example have a green loan where you said you could, you could lend money to, to one of the oil majors and say, we're going to lend you $100 million and you can only use that money to fund your renewable energy activity. And, and because you've got a specified use of proceeds provision, you can then declare that to be taxonomy aligned on the basis that the activity that you're financing, as distinct from the activities of the company as a whole, is aligned with the taxonomy. So... You know, you, 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 there are ways to address that, but I think you know, as a, as a general principle, a lot of people are concerned that the taxonomy isn't funding the transition. It's 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 actually. I mean, you could argue that if 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 you're going to get more investment once you've transitioned, then that's in itself an, an incentive to transition, right? So you could argue it's doing some good by creating incentives for people to move from where they are now to become taxonomy aligned. But the question is how they finance that transition and the taxonomy may not really help them with that. So I've more or less reached my time. Um, we've already really uh, talked about these points, thanks largely to your excellent questions. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but, but, but yeah, I, I, I don't really have time to talk about the UK, other than to say um, that the UK has decided to follow the EU's lead on the taxonomy. So there is work going on uh, to modify the taxonomy uh, for the UK market. One of the things they're focusing on is the do no significant harm criteria, which they think are too restrictive and, and out, you know, mean that it's very hard for activities to really qualify. One estimate has, I think it's about 4% of the FTSE all share would qualify as taxonomy aligned, about, about 4% of all economic activities that are 
financed by companies uh, in the FTSE All Share would qualify. So a pretty small percentage, but only about 0. Point, I think it's 0. 0.6 percent uh, actually qualify once you run the Do No Significant Harm test. So uh, less than 1 percent of activities in the UK you know, financed by the FTSE All Share would be compliant. So the UK is looking, I think, at making the tax on them a little bit broader, particularly by focusing on the restrictive Do No Significant Harm test. But in principle, uh, it's going to follow as much of the EU's uh, rules as, as, as it can. By contrast, the SFDR has decided not to follow at all, and it's come up with its own proposal. It was only published by the FCA um, at the end of October, only a few weeks ago, uh, for a different regime, which is much more uh, a labelling regime. Um, so it starts out as a labelling regime with disclosures to match rather than a disclosure regime which has become uh, a, 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 a labelling regime in, in fact. Um, uh, the, the, the UK has kind of learnt that lesson and is starting from the other end, is starting with labels. Um, so we'll see how that develops, but that's, a, that, that's the UK's uh, approach. Yes.